Well, hopefully that makes sure you're all awake. Um, the reason I wanted to show that clip was A, to make sure you are awake, but also the interesting thing about that clip is that is an amalgamation of all of the car crashes that are in one of the high risk uh, sports uh, for 2010 in, in that clip. It's viewed by over half a million of people every Sunday. The significant incidents that occur are fairly traumatic. Out of all of those clips that you saw, there was not one fatality, there was not one broken bone. That's quite impressive. And what is more impressive is how it actually occurred. The Formula One Association has a very specific institute. And when you start to look up, as I did, this concept of how does safety get integrated into Formula One? Now, obviously, it's a very different industry. It's a very wealthy industry. It has a lot less people to contend with and a lot less complexity. Seriously high risk. But what really caught me was that when we start to look at the safety, and this is a grid from, from their website, that there is continuous cause and effect. Something occurred. Safety was changed. Changes in regulation, changes in the concept similar to aviation that Kevin spoke about earlier on. And then they saw results. So each time they could identify what happened, whether it was cars, whether it was circuits, whether it was the drivers, whether it was the, organizational, the, the organization itself, and what that impact means. 
As a result, there's been no fatalities in Formula One since 1994. But more importantly, they could continue to see the evolution of safety within Formula One. They invested a lot. They can see what the returns are. The problem we have in healthcare at the moment is that we have invested a lot, but we have yet to see exactly what the gains are. Now, that does not mean, and I know I'm preaching to the converted, that does not mean we working in patient safety and quality improvement have not succeeded in a lot of areas. We have, but what Kevin referred to, uh, the Americans referring to the takeaway, um, or that knowledge base, or as my five-year-old would say, so what, is still something that's eluding us. Really quality improvement in patient safety in, in health system in Ireland is something that, that has really appeared since the 1990s, the early 1990s. And at the beginning, it was very much as, as Paul was saying, those concepts, this is a good idea. We really should evaluate. We really should look at things. And it always sticks with me. I was involved with the Irish Society for Quality Healthcare in 1997, and they put a call out for quality improvement, a registry. And it kind of resonated again what, what Philip Crowley was talking about, the Quality Improvement Awards. And we got this big book. It was a lovely blue book. And it was full of nice things, full of good things. But it wasn't quality improvement. It wasn't about structure. It wasn't about science. It wasn't about using data. All of the things that we've heard today from all of those interest, industries. Patient safety, as you know, is very reactive in Ireland. We've, it's been reactive to the likes of Leeds Cross, to the Rebecca O'Malley case. That has resulted in positions being created, in organizations being created, in regulatory bodies being created. And it was interesting to hear from two of the speakers today that quality and patient safety is not something that can be regulated into existence. The strange thing is, though, in Ireland, in the Irish health system, where regulation has come into effect, is where we have seen that patient safety. The follow-on from that, though, is, as Mark Brandon said, we still can't tangibly prove that that is worthwhile. All of our energies, all of our frameworks, so what? Where are we getting in relation to that? I was able to have a look at the presentations before you during the week, so I decided to somewhat maybe cynically uh, redraft Paul's graft. Since the 1990s, we've really had, in the early stages of it, that's a nice idea, no action. As we move through getting into the Celtic Tiger area, we had those champions, and a lot of you are those champions. If you're not, you're in the wrong place. And we're now gradually, as we've heard from the Quality Patient Safety Director, as we see HICWA coming in, good strategies, good concepts. But we're still very much in the phase where patient safety is based on regulation. And I use accreditation as the same as that. Because as Mark Brandon referred to, accreditation in Australia is not legislative, but people do it because there is funding based. Accreditation in Ireland is the same thing. A lot of private sectors, just as Paul Murphy said earlier on, accreditation is a requirement to get funding. So now that's where we are at the stage. We're not gone beyond that. And that quote from John Billings, who was the Director of Healthcare Quality and Safety in HICWA, kind of coined it. Standards in healthcare have been reactive. We've still been reactive, and it has still come to regulation. So after today's sessions, the questions that I have are, all the work that we have done in Ireland since the 1990s, have we saved lives? Have we reduced harm? Have we improved the care? And that is the question. So all, all of this work, has it been worthwhile? All of the blood, sweat, and tears, all of the trying to say, change the culture that we work in. Now, you're the converted, so you know it's worthwhile. But when we are dealing with the staff in the front line and those demands that were made reference to, the demands on our time, with the reduced resources, increased pressures, can we actually demonstrate it? Can we, as Paul referred to, the evidence-based management. So what have we learned from others? And this has gone back to the Formula One. The Formula One has a good selling point for safety. We did this, this was the result. Cause, effect, benefit. So that difficulty is, is something where we ourselves need to learn from. From our own research, we've estimated within the public sector alone, we're spending around eight million on patient safety initiatives per year. It's a lot of money. The question is, based on that, what are we getting as a result of it? 
Nationally, we can't say, yes, it's worthwhile because we have had a reduction in this type of harm. We have had a reduction in post-op site infection rates. We have had a reduction in deaths because the information isn't there. This is the most recent report that is on the Clinical Indemnity Schemes website from 2010. They have the responsibility for the public sector for gathering all that information that we need. What do we know from it? We know that the greatest category is 30,000 of things happened, not good. It is not telling us whether even the slips, trips, and falls were serious, whether we are making headway, whether we're going backwards or forwards. Now, most of you here can't address that problem. And I was conscious listening to the presentations today that we need to focus on what we can do, what you can do, the responsibility of our own organizations. Well, unfortunately, locally, we don't know what impact we're having in relation to patient safety, but we can. This is all not negative. There is a possibility. We do know anecdotally when things work and when things don't work. And I remember when one of the, the first involvements I had, which was 20 years ago with regards to ISO in healthcare, the feedback afterwards was, you know, things seem better. That's nice, but we'd like to have more than that. So that concept of patient safety culture, which is really great to hear about uh, from Philip and the, the Quality Patient Safety Directorate, is moving towards it. It is still at a remove. When you talk to frontline care, they talk about patient safety as if they were talking about human resources. It is distant, it is tangible, but it is at a remove. And the real problem that we have seen, and we get the opportunity to work with a lot of organizations through the year, is that lack of correlation. What does it mean to me? Hand hygiene was mentioned, and it's a, it's a good practical one. Well, our rates of hand hygiene are low, so what? Doesn't make a difference. I didn't even know, is it not my team, it's somebody else's team. I don't even know what my post-op infection rates are. So therefore, I can't see why hand hygiene is going to have an impact with me. I don't see why I need to invest time in serious incident reviews because I haven't seen any changes in relation to it. So, so what? Why have we invested all this time? Have we seen the changes? Well, we've seen some change. And we'll probably, quite soon, see a lot more change. Unfortunately, that Zoom and some were the taglines in relation to the Institute of Health Improvement. And we see that HICWA now is, is doing a lot of work in relation to their development. But I thought this was really at the core of the time and energy that we within our own organizations are spending. 100,000 lives was to reduce the adverse death, not that any other death is, the, the avoidable deaths in relation to medica medical errors. 100,000 lives. The next one up was to reduce harm by 5 million. Not maybe, not sometimes, but actual quantifiable, we did this, our return on investment, as Paul said. I remember doing an interview once, and they said, what's quality and safety all about? And I said, it is financially driven. Quality and safety was designed to get efficiency and effectiveness. I didn't get the job. The reason? Because I left the last line out. And by doing that, we can provide better care, advanced care, more care. We need to be able to demonstrate those returns in the investment. The concepts of quality and patient safety is a nice thing has long gone. We've heard plenty about the hand hygiene issues, and I think we're using that today as a very practical one. And when we started to ask people in the hospitals that got beating in the press with regards to hand hygiene, a lot of it was, I don't think that's my team or I've never heard how, that, how we're doing in relation to it. Or, well, to be honest, I think my post-op surgical site infection rates are fine. So that urgency for change didn't exist. There was no need for it. And these people continued on and said, that in the press, that's bad. I pity the management team. So in relation to regulation, we have seen that impact come in, that it does drive things forward. But people are doing it within our organizations, and you and I both know this, to satisfy the regulator, not to make that difference. And we see that time and time again. The other one I just wanted to pull up, because it's one that kind of brings the whole thing together for ourselves, and one that we can actually work on, is complaints, complaints management. Everyone loves complaints management. You spend so much time, you're so happy to spend time on it. 
Fergal Quinn, who's still a senator and will be a senator for quite some more time, obviously, um, in his book, Crowning the Customer, said, a complaint is a gift. And I've heard it called a lot of other things, but we, over the last year, have, have, have been involved in a lot of complaints management, and we have estimated approximately 10,000 a year is the number of complaints through the public system. Okay, formal complaints, ones that require the your service, your say, response, and 30 days, 20 days, and all of that. It takes up a huge amount of time. Many of these have been identified as incidents that we never heard of, that we were not able to pick up. So that is a gift. Then we have more time taken up by the National Advocacy Office, the National Ombudsman's Office. Yet when we look at the ownership of complaints, and think of it as more of an incident, something going wrong, under legislation, the ownership is a complaints officer, automatically removing it from those who have a responsibility to make sure what we're doing is correct. There's something wrong there, that if I am the clinical director of a directorate, that the responsibility for addressing something, which is my area, rests with a complaints officer. The other aspect that we've looked at, and we, we reviewed over 120 complaints specifically, was that there is a benefit to the individual. The complaints process is good. It addresses things, it gets things notified. But has it actually improved care? And of all those reviews that we carried out, there were long-term improvements in just 4.1%. It's five. The rest were dealt with as individual things a difficulty that we had to move on. So we know that we have an estimate of the number of official complaints, and we do know that that is a culture that is important to deal with. The difficulty is that we don't use that as the gift. Fergal Quinn, when he got complaints, saw it as an opportunity to make sure that things were improved. In the health system currently, we have the problem that complaints are something that is forced upon us by regulation that we have to address as an individual case. The need for CAPA is a very practical thing, taking all of the information that we got today into something into our practical day-to-day -day life. For those of you who have ever read the ISO standards in any shape or form, CAPA refers to corrective action, preventative actions. And when we looked at incident reviews for 2012 for ones that Healthcare Informed were involved in across all types of areas over the year, about 2,010 different organizations. Again, we had the same knock-on effect. We're good with an incident. We can deal with it. But in less than 0.1% were there identified preventative actions. We can correct, we can sort that problem out, but long-term preventative were not occurring. It is a very practical thing. That can be staff education at root cause analysis. The other thing we found with serious incident reviews is we are very good at root cause analysis, we, all of us. But the so what? Not so much. We're very good at the reports, but what has happened as a result is the area that we do not have the evidence based in. Similarly, with regards to audits and inspections, when we carried out a review of organizations, 26 in particular, we didn't have those preventative actions to deal with other inspections or regulations because we didn't have that information. We need, as organizations, to start addressing the preventative as well as the corrective. We need to have that correlation of information, of data, so we don't have to tell them, honestly, trust me, this is important. So whether it is a negative correlation, your infection rates are increasing, our hand hygiene rates are going down, or positive, look at the time you have invested in dealing with medication errors with, regard, with regards to cytotoxics. Do you know what has happened as a result? Your return on investment is worthwhile, and we haven't been able to do that. In God we trust, all others bring data is one that we must live by, and it's one that I certainly believe in. We have a huge amount of data. There's no shortage of it. What we're lacking for our frontline staff is very simple understanding. You and I, we know it, but we have to translate what these incidents, what these results are actually doing. We need to utilize the framework. The framework that, that the Joint Commission had, the fifth edition, focuses extensively on the use of that information. The national standards, and as we see the guidelines for, for safer and better care, similarly. These frameworks provide us with a focus of our energies because we have less and less time to do more and more. 
That's what the frameworks are there for. Focus on what's important. Accreditation, though, and licensure, which we'll see in a number of years, are not an achievement in itself. And this is a common thing that we hear. You have invested so much in patient safety and quality. What did you achieve? We got accredited. No patient is delighted about getting accredited. They want better, safer care, and accreditation is not going to provide it. We've heard about the integration of quality. We've heard about from Philip Crowley about the new directorates, the new structures within HSE and within the private sector. And it is that ownership, it is that moving away from the complaints officer, from the quality manager, to what is integrated in our day to day, that we're able to support those services and be able to demonstrate what they need. As we move towards the next stage, towards the end of that timeline, end of my timeline, maybe more so than the end of Paul's timeline, is that we have the frameworks there for quality, for patient safety. We need to integrate that in. It is not HR. It is not the finance department. It is part of the way that we provide care. To convince those who are not the converted, we need to be able to gather that data, to be able to bring the correlation, and to be able to utilize preventative actions. If I was asked you to take one thing away, it is when you are looking at incidents, when you are looking at complaints, where are our preventative actions that will stop this type of complaint happening, not in one department or not in one directorate, but the organizations as a whole. The other one which Paul made reference to, coming to an end now, is the local major initiatives. In your organization, is there one major initiative which reduces harm each year. It's not a lot. It's one of my favorite measurable elements in the new fifth edition of quality and patient safety, standard 11, measurable element two, a proactive risk reduction exercise. So whatever is the big risk, that you actually tackle it as a major head-on initiative. And that that initiative shows the return on investment for those who have been involved. 50 years ago, Martin Luther King in Washington said, I believe. Next year, I want to go further and believe. We want to know. It is not a belief that we need to have that the energy and enthusiasm that everyone here expends in relation to patient safety and quality improvement is worthwhile. We need to be able to prove it. We need to be able to say to those who question, so what? This is why we do it. This is the reason we provide better care.